Well, you will um, most of sorry, most of your um, most of you don't necessarily need the associate's degree from degree from this school, right? To transfer, you going into the sciences in general, you just want to make sure you get all your transfer requirements, right? For whatever school you're trying to go to. That said, if you meet all of your transfer requirements, you probably also meet the requirements for getting an associate's degree here. Um, so while it's more important, if you have to pick between meeting your transfer degree or getting an AA, meet your transfer requirements. That then it helps, it does help the school if you get an AA because we actually get additional funding if you get a degree rather than your transfer requirements of leaving. It, and it's, it looks good on our numbers too because the, for whatever reason, the, the prevailing movement in higher education is to treat community colleges like our job is to churn out degrees. Even though, especially in the sciences, most of you are not done with an AA. Most of you need to go finish somewhere else in order to get your job or wherever you're headed in, in life. Um, so I really don't like that, but that's currently what our funding formula is partially based on. It's just how many degrees can we print out? So while you're here, if you're going to be meeting all your gen ed requirements for your other school anyway, um, if you do, I think it's like one button you have to hit to like petition for graduation if you meet the requirements. I'd encourage you to do that, even if you don't necessarily want to walk at graduation. I was telling some of the students before, I didn't walk at my master's graduation. Um, I didn't even know I got a diploma. I was just, you know, I'm like, well, whatever, it's on my transcript. I don't really care if I have a piece of paper, um, but it's still helpful. For, for us at LTCC, um, if, if you do go forward with that. Either way, um, and if you have any more questions about the weirdness of academia and how whatever transfers or doesn't transfer or what some word, weird word means, please come see me um, because I have spent more time in academia than not just about at this point, if you count undergrad. I think I'm, yeah, I have crossed the threshold. I've spent more time in, in in higher education or working in higher education than not. Um, so I know I've seen most of the issues that can come up. So if you have any questions, just come ask me because um, it is some, it is weird. And along with that, in terms of other random things that um, that uh, you might not know if you just haven't seen them before, I'll go a little bit out of order here. Um, let me make sure I get the right version. Um, if you have any questions about how to enter things into Word to make it look professional or into um, the uh, quiz boxes. So I'm just going to go over a few ways that you can actually get subscripts and superscripts because a number of you were like, well, I don't really want to write out the, the full chemical balance reaction like this because it looks bad or I don't think it works very well. So um, here's an example of two different ways that people showed how to, uh, what the um, formula balance formulas were. They're both full credit, they both could be improved. So what's happening with this top one is I'm guessing based on the red, that they're just using a screen grabber, you know, do, to do a screenshot of the character and pasting that in. Um, what you can, there are a couple other ways you can do that. Um, one, if you're going to do it this way, this totally works. It, it's less obvious what you did, and I probably wouldn't even notice noticed if you just turn off the, um, the red outline when you use the um, snipping tool, which um, Windows. That was the insert tool. Yeah, that was the insert, insert tool that automatically did that. Usually you can right click on it and turn off the red border. The red thing didn't show up until it was until it submitted. Um, I know a lot of these, the snipping tools will have a default to have a red line around it, but fusion thing or okay, yeah. where you're hinting. That's what I did because that is also like Google because I know you use subscripts and like Google Docs and stuff, but this one's like a little weird. This one's a little weird. It is right here. If you wanted to, most people just did it, did the regular type it in and then just by hand it's it's a pain because you have to come up here and hit superscript and then type it in. So I 
I want to type in um, HG sub two with plus two charge, you know, HG, go up here, click subscript two, click undo the subscript, then do the superscript two plus. And you can do that. It's just a lot of clicks. It's really obnoxious to have to do that. Um, the other way you can do it in, in this version is the equation editor. And you can do the whole thing in here. And if you, you can. Oh. And if you know what the right commands are, you can actually just type them in. If I want to do the same thing here, I can do HG sub open parentheses two close parentheses. And it types it in there. And I don't even have to touch the mouse. And then you can do super or um, carrot. Oops. Yeah, you get, and then you get out of there and then do superscript open parentheses two plus close parentheses. And so you can wind up typing stuff in like that. And actually that one, you don't even need to, ooh, yeah, I really did it. What was that? Yeah. Um, so you can type the whole thing in here because then you can also get, um, then you can also get the fancy arrows as well to make it look if you wanted to put in the different arrows. They're all in here too, including equilibrium arrows right there. So wherever the cursor is, I put the cursor in a good spot there. And typing on an unfamiliar keyboard, if you're not looking at what you're doing, means it all looks weird. Um, but yeah, so you can do it that way. And then if you do the whole thing that way, then we hit done, it inserts the whole thing in here. And when you hit submit, it'll probably have that red line around it again, but you'll have, it'll be around the entire thing rather than just individual pieces. Um, the other way you can do it, which is probably the way that I would default to doing it in this case, is if you just go to anything Microsoft, yeah, or in Google, it's going to have their equivalent equation editor where some of the context will be different. But if you build it in something in a more familiar um, program or app or whatever uh, website, you can in Word, you or in anything in um, Microsoft Office, you can just come up here and go to Insert and go to Symbol. And then it'll give you all the options. You can click around, you know, you can do fractions, you can do subscripts, superscripts, all that kind of stuff. So anytime you're trying to type in an equation for, <laughs> or for chemistry and make it look good, um, if you type it in here, you can do HG sub two superscripts plus two plus yeah, you know, and, and do it that way. And you can wind up, you get, if you're going to be doing this a lot, you get pretty good with what are the keyboard commands and stuff like that. Um, and it's, that barely takes me more time than type, than writing it out by hand. However, for this class, that's also an option for this type of problem. They just had me type it in here. You can handwrite it and just upload a picture. If you wanted to handwrite it, take a picture with your phone and then submit it from your phone and just upload a picture, that's valid too. Um, in order to show your work or or whatever you want to show, you could, you could do your whole page if you wanted to, so I could see your whole page. Um, I would encourage you to learn how to use the equations because it looks so much cleaner. And if you're trying to write, you know, a nice lab report or something for one of your upper division classes, you don't want to have pictures of handwritten equations mixed in with your nice typed up stuff and figures. Um, so it's a good skill to have if you're going into the sciences. Um, that in that um, the versions you have here, when you look at it, it says um, this format, LATEX, latex, is actually the common version for how you write any any math or science equation in the, in grad school or if you're publishing anything, you have to submit all your equations and stuff in latex because then they'll be rendered. Um, so that it, it looks good for whatever, you know, whatever type of base they're using or whatever. Um, it's all it's coded in rather than just being a picture at that point, which means you can edit it too if you need to go back and change things. That's the other problem with taking a picture and uploading a picture or a screenshot. So if you need to make one little error, you have to retype the whole thing, right? But if you type it in like this, you can copy and paste it and then go back and tweak things. Um, really easily. So it actually will save you time if you do need to make any adjustments. Um, is there anything about any of that that I didn't 
Anything else other than that? Uh, and, oh, I guess the other way you can do it too is is uh, it doesn't work as well for sub subscripts or superscripts. But if you just want a specific arrow, you can always just look up. You just Google stuff. It'll show up at the character, and then you can copy and paste it and put it in your regular text. Um, most fonts are going to have pretty much all the chemis chemistry stuff that you would need like that. So you can always do it that way rather than you know, typing in an arrow by doing you know, dash dash greater than. That also works, but it doesn't look as good. So you just Google the name of the character you're looking for and copy and paste the character. And then you still get that, that advantage. And you don't have to, to do it like this. Um, again, not that this got marked down any points or would in this class. But trying to give you life skills as well as just chemistry knowledge. Whether or not that's a usable life skill, that depends a little bit more on your point of view and where you're going in life. But the sort of thing I found useful that and keyboard shortcuts, especially in Excel, knowing how to get around Excel even without touching your mouse is really, really helpful if you're doing anything in the sciences because everybody has giant data sets now. I mean, you know, thousands of columns and thousands of rows moving from one side to the other without having to scroll endlessly across all of those rows is really, really helpful. All right. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. This most ver recent version. Anyway. Um, we'll talk about random. Oh, that's why this is not this year's questions. Just did an update. Let me go back to the PDF real quick. Because um, there were some good relevant questions, and I, I do always try to answer all the relevant questions I can find, by which relevant, I mean, just mean that it applies to everybody or to the material that we're, we're currently covering. The random questions, sometimes I'll just respond to you one on one. Um, when balancing oxidation or reduction reaction, you should always split them up with half reactions. Yes, yes. Um, you're using that half that method where you're going to add waters to one side, hydrogens to the other, and then balance charge. You've got to have half reactions for it to really work. Um, otherwise, it's hard to tell what's going what's happening exactly or how many electrons are changing hands. Um, do half reactions have any applications outside of being an easy way to balance complex reactions? Well, I think today's lab answered that a little bit, right? Being able to look at those standard cell potentials and um, even in if I pull up the uh, textbook. The end of any of the textbooks, just like with those other appendices with the delta H formation or the Ka values, etc. I'm stressing this computer out. Answers and take forever. But basically, what I was going to say is that the, just like there was, there was like six half reactions, seven half reactions in a table. There is an entire appendix of half reactions, including their standard reduction potentials, in the in the back of the textbook. So having them as half reactions is is hugely useful, if for no other reason than now we're getting closer. Um, there's all your, your solubility, KFs, standard electrode potentials. There we go. And look at all these. And you can combine any two of these to look at a balanced redox reaction and get a, get the expected voltage for that redox reaction. So just like having Ka in the table was helpful just because it means you don't have to 
you know, write out the reaction every time. You can just write Ka equals, um, or you can look it up. Having all of these means you can combine them, any two of them, to figure out what the cell potential is, which means statistically, if there's, I don't know, call it 400 reactions in, in this, probably not quite that many, but that means there's about 400 squared potential combinations of those two reactions, right? Um, which would be a whole lot more to write if you didn't use that, that half reaction method to organize them, right? If they're negative compared to positive, that tells you whether it's like which side is the oxidation. Right? Exactly. So just like we were finding out in um, in the uh, enthalpy, and yeah, with the enthalpies, when you reverse products and reactants, you flip the sign. So for these, yeah. um, if you say for the zinc sulfide, this is for the reduction. If we wanted to look at the oxidation, zinc, zinc metal plus sulfide turning to zinc and sulfide plus two electrons, we would flip the sign too. So in, we're always going to flip one of them. When we're combining any two of these reactions, we need one to be a reduction, one to be an oxidation. You can't have two reductions happen because you need those electrons to come from somewhere. So it's always going to be one oxidation, one reduction, but they're always written all as reductions. So you just have to know that when you see these, this is, and then they're usually even written, um, called not just a half reaction, they're called a standard reduction potential. And then you would flip it to get the standard oxidation potential. But by convention, we always write them as reductions. Um, and that's really just a flip of the coin. I don't know why they pick reductions rather than oxidations, um, but they did. So here we are. Um, will the half reactions always balance? What happens if it can't balance, not just on paper, but experimentally? Well, on paper, if it can't balance, that means we didn't add the right stuff, right? And all of these, <clears throat> what's common to all of these reactions is that they're always going to have electrons as a reactant. And when you flip them, you get the electrons as a product, right? And so that means that in order to keep them balanced, all you need to do is when, make sure when you add them that your electrons are going to cancel out. So... There's four electrons versus two electrons. If I wanted to know what would happen if I added these two together, I also have to multiply this top reaction. I have to multiply that top reaction by two and for the coefficients. But this is where it gets a little bit tricky with reduction potentials. That doesn't affect this number. Products and flipping products and reactants flips the sign on your reduction potential. But multiplying this whole thing by two doesn't mean we multiply this by two. And we'll talk about why that is later today. Uh, but basically, the standard cell potential only matters for is your standard cell potential is basically of any voltage, is basically. You can write it as, as energy in units of volts. And so if we have electrons up here and they're moving downhill in energy here, to here, that change in energy is a voltage if we're using the right units. So in some cases, we would look at that in terms of high energy going to low energy. We rate it in terms of kilojoules per mole. If we wanted to put it in units for a single molecule going through that reaction or a single electron, we'd measure it in terms of electron volts, um, which is more of a physics unit than it is a chemistry unit. If we're just looking at the distance between these two levels, it doesn't actually matter how many electrons are moving. It just matters where they start and where they end, right? It's a little bit like Knowing the voltage is a little bit like knowing what's your total change in altitude, say, between here and Carson City. If, I, if you want to know the total amount of energy that you gain going from here to Carson City in terms of kinetic energy, then you need to know things like how much the car weighs, how many cars are going, right? How many times is that trip happening to get a total energy? But none of that affects 
the altitudes, right? The altitudes are the same regardless of how much energy transfers from high energy to low energy. And that's what the voltages are, is it's really the energy levels. The total energy you get out is based on how many electrons make that trip. But the difference in energy is the voltage. And that's why we don't multiply it by two when we, when we do that. Oh, probability. Is that wind? That looks too neat to be wind sand writing. No, that is. That's wind. Is wind? Oh, yeah. I underestimated wind. Oh, okay. <laughs> you never underestimate wind. <laughs> yeah. This is pretty good. This is getting pretty good at the colors. Boy. Yeah, that was, I automatically felt organized when I looked at that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, underestimate wind at your own peril. Yeah. Um, somebody, and so, and also just, Again, I only got through about the first half of these. So if you had a question that was relevant that I haven't covered yet in these four, don't worry, because we'll talk about it on uh, on Thursday. Um, I'm kind of, but, or sorry, I guess the second part of this, what happens if it doesn't bear out balance experimentally? Well, that'd be like you don't have water around. Right? If you try to balance the reaction using water, but you don't have water, you're actually missing a reactant in that case, right? So you actually have more of a limiting reactant situation. The reaction can't happen even though your reaction itself is balanced. So just because the reaction is balanced says that's it's still a hypothetical. If we have all the pieces, here's what happens and here's what we make and these are the ratios. But if you're missing one of the reactants or one of the products, well, missing a product is different, right? But if you're missing one of the reactants, it still can't happen. And so that would change probably how we balance. We're in a totally anhydrous environment, no water found, we're on another planet or something. We would have a different way, standard half reaction process. Maybe we would balance the oxygens with, I don't know, silicon dioxide instead of with water. Maybe if that was the abundant oxygen source that was present. Um, but because we're on earth and water is always present, no matter how much we try to get rid of it, there's pretty much always some water around. And there's pretty much always an acidic environment. And this gets to the second one. If we're in an aqueous environment and balance it like it's also acidic, because just because acidic solutions are more common, you just have water sitting out, DI water sitting out, it will become slightly acidic because it will take on CO2 from the atmosphere. And CO2, when you dissolve it in water, makes carbonic acid, which acidifies the water slightly. That's a pretty small amount, but it's going to be, in general, there's more acidic ions around, especially in DI water, than there are basic ions around, just based on our planet's chemistry, our planet's elemental, uh, like, uh, there's a geological term for, you know, what's the distribution of atoms and isotopes on our planet. Um, and if you happen to be in a basic environment, if you're talking not about DI water, but talking about groundwater that's passed through an aquifer that's that put some metal ions in it, and now it's a basic, slightly basic environment, like most tap water, then you would you would do the al alkaline. But we start with acidic as the base because that's just more common in flat and on the surface of the planet. And then we just have this, but then here's how you would adjust it for an alkaline um, environment. Um, and if it's not specified, if it just says use the half reaction method to balance this, and it doesn't say in a basic environment, assume it's acidic. That's usually your best choice. I'll try to be as specific as I can when I'm finding these so that you're not confused by that, but when in doubt, assume it's acidic. All right. Um, I'm just going to present this from the PDF rather than me getting out my computer. I think what happened, why I have the old version here, is that this didn't, um, I clicked the wrong button. I hit save, but I didn't close it, which means it doesn't have update to Dropbox. So let me pull up the last few slides from last lecture, and start those, but basically those are going to be um, 
what we talked about in lab, talking about half reactions and separating them and doing cell potentials. But just so that we've all seen them and give you a chance to ask questions about anything that you missed yeah. on in lab, we'll go through those real quick. Ended here. That's all right. So this is just more. This is the same thing we just talked about. Um, difference in altitude is voltage. How much energy changes hands for something like water flowing downhill is based on how much water moves, but it's tied to that difference in altitude. And, and so typically where we think about this from the point of view of the electrons and the electrons are going from a high potential energy to a lower potential energy and they're moving from um, from the anode which is where the which, and the anode is where the uh, oxidation happens. So the electrons are being produced here at the anode, sent downhill in energy, not physically downhill in energy, but it's convenient to think about it that way, which is why it's arranged top to bottom like this. Um, and they're moving towards the cathode. And in chemistry, so, and again, I have to be careful with this and make the disclaimer that in different fields, sometimes they change up the way that they think about the charges on anodes versus cathodes. In chemistry, and I believe in physics, we think of the anode as being negatively charged. And the electrons are moving towards the positive charges. That makes sense with the way we think about charges, right? Electrons are negative, so they're going to try to avoid the negative anode, move towards the positive cathode. I think it's mostly in engineering and in some places, circuits where they reverse that, where they think about the cathode as being negative because that's where the electrons are going to, which is totally backwards. But I just have to make that disclaimer that you double check that. It's not necessarily that the other class is wrong, but different disciplines define it differently. For this class, the anodes are negative and the cathodes are positive, which matches up with anion and cation, right? The anode, the N and anode is for negative. That means that's where the electrons are coming from, which means that's where the oxidation is happening. <laughs> and whatever is using the electrons is at the cathode, and that's where the reduction is happening. Right? And if this reaction is happening spontaneously, it means that you're, you're by definition, we're always talking about the cell potential as being positive. If the reaction is happening in the forward direction, the way it's written, cell potential is positive. So in today's lab, in yesterday's lab, if you measured a negative potential, that just meant that you mixed up the red and the black alligator clips, right? Because it, we're always going to define our cell potential as positive, even though it's the same number. If you get a negative, you can just say, oh, well, that means that the, that the electrons are moving backward through the multimeter. Compared to the way I had it. So I need to switch the cathode the, in, or the oxidation, the reduction. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can think about it. Just try to be internally consistent. The way you think about it, just make it consistent and make it make sense to you. Um, However, you need to think about it to keep those those cell potentials positive. Um, we already talked about this, but here's just another version. This one's a much smaller version than that whole appendix, but bigger than the one that's in your lab. And again, I'm not quite sure why they decided to go with reduction potential instead of, of um, just doing it in terms of kilojoules per mole, probably because they figured all the first galvanic cells that Volta made, I want to say were in the 1700s. 
Um, and so we're talking way before and they knew what a mole was at that point, but and they knew what joules were at that point, but nobody had really connected the dots between chemistry and physics yet. And so Volta is approaching this from the, from the chemistry side. Said, well, we need a unit to talk about about how much energy this is. And so rather than doing a kilojoules per mole, he did he did um, develop volts, which I don't believe he actually named after himself. But there are some scientists that'll do that sort of thing. But usually, if somebody who gets a unit named after them, their students came back and said, "No, nah, we should name that after after the old man." Um, and as a sort of you know tribute to to somebody who already did that. That said. Murray Curie, being the boss that she was, did vote to name Curium after herself because she said, no, I put in my time, I put in my dues. I deserve to have Nelma named after me. By that, she was right. Um, we can look at these reactions happening. This is not a voltaic cell, but we can see these re redox reactions happening in the same place. Uh, um, if we look, if we just put something like copper ions in zinc metal, In, in the same container, we do see these reactions happening. That process, that buildup right there, is not the zinc oxidizing. The zinc is oxidizing. Um, but the thing is about that is the zinc ions are soluble. So when you go through this, this process, you wind up with the solid zinc becoming dissolved and floating away in solution. And what's actually forming on the surface is actually the solid copper. This is one of the ways that you can do, that you can plate something, is just have a, a fairly reactive metal and a less reactive metal as an ion in solution. If you dip your reactive metal in your um, solution, you wind up depositing copper atoms, in this case, directly onto the surface. It doesn't work that well if you do it quite straight this way, because we still need to leave enough room for the zinc atoms to leave once they become oxidized. But you do wind up with a pretty decent um, surface covered in copper. If you took that and then melted the copper, you'd be able to, to get it to form like a layer of copper on the outside. So that, that, no, never mind. It's not like that's not alchemy, then. Like, you're not. It's more like, going back to that era. Yeah. Um, they, they're starting to figure stuff like this out before it was really, before they started using the scientific method. Um, scientific method, and um, there was a, a book published by Robert Boyle in Scotland called The Skeptical Chemist which is spelled in Old English. I want to say it's like... There's some weird, there's some Y in there and something that we would spell with a K is also is actually a C, things like that. So it's Old English. This was written back in 1500 or so and in Scotland. Um, and if you think you can't understand the Scots today, go back to 1500. It really was a sub-dialect of English at the time. Um, and uh, that coincided with, with the scientific method that was first, call it discovered, but formulated in Iran, in Persia, in, at about, I want to say 880, um, that making its way west is what led Robert Boyle to write this, and that's really the beginning of chemistry. So we are definitely in the realm, the right time frame as far as, was it a science, kind of? was also kind of just a scam to get people to pay you money. Um, I'm not sure that the, I know, I know some of the old alchemists thought that way. They didn't really believe they really knew what they were doing. They're just like, well, if I show the king this, he'll pay me some money and I can get closer to, you know, taking off with all my money. Um, but that's partially speculation. All right, 
So there's our voltaic galvanic cell. I mentioned in class today, and there's a kind of a crude drawing of it in the lab. This is what those really fancy galvanic cells look like. They actually take two beakers, physically connect them with a tube, and then put like this porous membrane in between the two. Why is it called salt bridge? Um, because an ionic compound, that especially one that dissolves in water, is known as a salt. The general term salt just means an ionic compound. Um, we don't. We typically avoid using that term in chemistry now because it's confusing because salt is sodium chloride. But historically, a salt was any ionic compound. So it was called a salt bridge because it allowed your positive ions and your negative ions to cross back and forth to balance the charge. Brings up there's a there's a chemistry joke about you hear about the chemist who got arrested for throwing sodium chloride at his, at his friends. They locked him up for assault. Mm -hmm. But this. <laughs> it's pretty good. Most of the chemistry one that are. Do they like have to change a membrane? Um, I uh, I'm not actually, I don't think so. <laughs> These are more or less permanent. They could but they're not like the dialysis tubing where they were. It would crack if it dried out. Most of these, they almost look like um, almost like a styrofoam. They're not actually styrofoam. They're made out of something like it's like a, a foam made of glass almost that has lots of tiny pores that move through it. Um, but it doesn't get it doesn't have that same issue where it, um, if it dries out, it breaks. Um, so I don't believe they would need to change those, but there, I'm sure there's some design. This is a historically accurate. This is what Volta actually made something to look like this. Um, now I'm sure they have they have other versions of it. We made a you know a bootleg version of it in lab. It accomplishes the same purpose, but while we'll using stuff that's all a lot cheaper and easier to store. Um, is there a reason we use potassium nitrate as a salt bridge? No, we could use sodium chloride. We could have used anything. You want to pick something that's not going to interfere with the redox reactions that are going to happen, but sodium is not going to be, ions are not going to be reduced very easily. Chloride is not going to be oxidized very easily. So sodium chloride probably will work too. Um, I don't know why, particularly for this lab, they picked sodium or potassium nitrate. Basically, any ions that are small enough that they can move through that dialysis tubing. So maybe it has to do, maybe dialysis tubing is more stable in the presence of potassium nitrate than sodium chloride. All right. So let's practice this just for a second. Which direction will this reaction proceed? Notice the way that we set up these half cells. Let's assume we had a salt bridge between these two. The really, really, um, you know, low income way of, of doing this, we're trying to get as cheap as possible. We don't even use dialysis tubing. You literally set it up in two beakers and then you soak a paper towel in sodium nitrate or potassium nitrate solution and then just put both ends of the paper towel across. That works as a salt bridge too. So let's assume we're doing that. We have a salt bridge. Um, what is the standard cell potential? Which, first off, which direction will the reaction proceed? We have these two half reactions. We, we have reactants and products on both sides. Copper can be copper two can be reduced to copper metal. Zinc two zinc with a plus two charge can be reduced to zinc. We have the reduction potentials right here. Which reaction? Which way are the electrons going to move? Zinc to the copper. Zinc to the copper. The electrons can move from right to left here. If the zinc is going to be oxidized, that means we get to flip this around, right? Which means we flip the sign. So we get set up the re uh, reduction potential. Standard oxidation potential would be plus 0 0.74 volts. And that means when we get our, our net reaction, when we add these together, we're going to get a positive voltage. Right? So figuring out which way the electrons move, what's offset and what's reduced, is just a matter of 
figuring out which of the two standard reductions can be flipped around to still give you a net positive voltage. Uh, and so what would our standard voltage be then? Yeah, 1.08. The plus 0.34 volts didn't change, and we're adding it to the um, plus 0.78 or 74 volts that we get when we flip this, the zinc's reduction potential. Right, the other way you can think about this when you're trying to find these is if it's if it's spontaneous, if the reaction is going to progress. It's always going to be the most positive number stays the way it is. The most positive reduction potential stays as a reduction. And the less positive or the negative reduction potential gets flipped around. That's how you always get a positive cell potential, right? Which makes sense mathematically, but we're talking these abstract terms about weird units. It's kind of sometimes hard to think about with basic maths a little bit. All right, how do we feel about these? Between this and the, and the write-up for the lab, got a pretty good handle on, on how these work-ish. We're getting there anyway. Chopped. Chopped. I haven't heard that since my son got into Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> All right, now, Uh, here's just another example. I don't know why I have so many examples of these, especially considering we've done this. Um, this is actually interesting in that you can actually, this little U-shaped piece, you literally can just plug the ends with cotton to slow things down. And that works well enough to be able to measure a voltage. Just a cotton ball stuffed into the end of a tube is enough of a barrier to keep the biggest ions where they are and allow the smaller ions to pass through. All right, so there's more practice. We'll do one more of these. Here's the cell potential. I already pulled the cell potentials out so you don't have to go look them up. What is the standard, the EMF is the cell potential. EMF stands for, um, depending on what textbook you read, it's either electromagnetic force or the electromotive force. But basically, it's the voltage. So we have these two reactions. If we're trying to add them up, it'll give us this reaction right here. First off, what we need to do so that we could add them up properly. Multiply the top by three. Yeah, we multiply that by three, not two. That doesn't affect the potential. Because if it tells us that this, we need three times as much iodine as normal, but it doesn't change the altitude difference between the two states. That's the same. All that can change with those is are you going downhill or uphill? That's switching the plus and minus. Sydney? Was that kind of what you were saying in lab today when I was asking how much of this I should use? And you said, like, it doesn't really matter because it's just like. Exactly. Okay. Uh, exactly. It doesn't really matter what the constant or what the coefficients are. That doesn't affect the voltage anyway. It'll affect how much energy you can get out of it before you reach equilibrium or before you run out of one of your reactants. That's the total amount of energy, though. But in terms of, you know, if you think about this in terms of energy levels and kilojoules per mole, how many moles you have doesn't affect kilojoules per mole, right? Kilojoules per mole for a reaction is constant. 
you might not actually have a whole mole, so you might have to stop before you get to that total number of kilojoules out. But kilojoules per mole delta H is a constant regardless of how many moles you start with. That's kind of the same logic that we're seeing here. The difference, the altitude change doesn't matter. Or so the altitude change is the voltage. And so it doesn't matter how many cars are going downhill, just what the total altitude changes. So finish answering this question, which of the needs are we going to have to reverse? The top one, if it's going to be spontaneous, we need to reverse the less positive one. So we're going to flip that. So that we're going to turn that into minus 0.54. So we're going to flip. Products and reactants so that we get an oxidation. So then when we add them together. For the whole cell. It's going to be 1.33. Minus 0.54, which don't make me borrow in my head. 0.79. Most mental arithmetic I would handle, but borrowing in my head, whatever reason, every time. I'd rather mentally take the square root of something than have to borrow in my head. We did have to multiply, uh, like when we were doing enthalpies, right? With enthalpies, we did because there was that per mole term. Yeah. And so the per mole term, if we said the reaction was happening three times as often, that per mole term came into play. Right? And so that's where these are a little bit tricky. Um. That that looks so gross. <laughs> um, sometimes when I see these and then move to a different computer, everything moves. Office is wonderful that way. Um, so does this graph look somewhat familiar? You have talked about delta G and reaching equilibrium in terms of of the reaction progression moving from left to right. All right. So, in this case, if we had delta G for a reaction, <laughs> delta G is not constant for a reaction, right? And so, this is where there was definitely a derivation, but it might have gotten glossed over, um, where you have this equation that relates the actual delta G to a standard delta G. In standard conditions, in this case, we don't just mean everything at at G ninety eight Kelvin. Standard conditions also apply to your concentrations. Your under standard conditions, your concentrations or your pressures, if you're dealing with KP, are all one. If your concentrations are all one, it doesn't really matter what your equation is or what the balancing is, right? If you wind up with, if you look at Q being products of reactants, if it's to the third over squared, that's going to affect things a little bit unless all of your concentrations are one, right? All of your concentrations are one, Q is one, right? That pretty with me? And what's natural log of one? Zero, which means if everything is at a concentration of one, your Gibbs free energy for a reaction is equal to the standard Gibbs free energy. That's why they pick one as the standard concentrations, because that allows this whole term to disappear. Right. And if you say, if when you're at equilibrium, the reaction is not spontaneous forward or backwards, right? It's Kind of a weird case where it's non spontaneous in any direction once you reach equilibrium, right? What is delta G going to be for a reaction that is not spontaneous forward or backward? Delta G has got to be zero. If delta G is zero, yeah. 
again. That's where that equation, this is where, why you probably just saw this as a derivation. We can say zero equals delta G naught plus RT ln. If you're at equilibrium, what is Q? Close, it's K. At equilibrium, that's, that's how you, you found Q is a way to determine if the reaction is going to go forward or backward, right? Well, what happens when you found Q and it was exactly equal to K? It was already in equilibrium, right? The definition of K is it's the reaction quotient at equilibrium. For any reaction, you take this and we rearrange it and solve for K, we get that familiar equation. I usually just abbreviate it. I usually forget to write the zero, the not on there. This actually is at standard conditions. So K is equal to E to the negative delta G naught over RT. In other words, our concentrations affect the current delta G, the current spontaneity is based on what is Q. What is the current reaction? So this is basically the mathematical underpinnings for why Q allows you to say whether you're going to go forward or backwards. This is the math behind why. Because if Q is too big, then you're going to have delta G be positive. And if delta G is positive, is the reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous? None. And not only that, if, if delta G is positive, what process is spontaneous? The first. The reverse reaction is spontaneous. And if delta G is negative, the forward reaction is spontaneous, right? So all this graph is showing you is that based on what your mole fraction is for reactants versus products, if Q is too small, you move towards products. If Q is too big, you move backward. And if Q is right here, then you're already at equilibrium. This same logic applies to the cell potentials. Cell potentials also have an analogous equation. Can we take a break here in a minute? I'll see if I can find the figure. But, but essentially, you can tie equilibrium constants, cell potentials, and delta G values are all three sides of the same coin. You could have a coin with three sides. If the, I guess if the coin is delta G, then one side of it could be cell potential, the other side is equilibrium constants, but they're all the same thing, just different ways of measuring. We still have three sides. Yeah. Count the edges. Yeah. I only use coins that have rounded edges, so that doesn't count. Um, the last thing before we take our break, here's another definition of delta G. Okay, yeah. Delta G <laughs> equal to negative n times f times e. E is our cell potential that we were just talking about. <clears throat> n is the moles of electrons in the balance of reaction. So remember how we add them together? We had to make the electrons cancel out. The number of electrons that add up that you had to cancel out is n. So for that example, two slides ago, two, three slides ago, we had to cancel out six electrons to make this work, right? For these two half reactions, n would be six. Whatever the number of electrons are that, that were on both sides that you canceled out, so what you plug in for n. And then f is Faraday's constant. The nice thing about that is it's a constant and it's on your equation sheet. So while this is a pain to have to go back and forth, it does allow us to communicate, allows the electrical engineers to communicate with the chemists, to communicate with the physics people. Physicists, there is a word for that. I know it. 
Um, and it also allows us to connect. Here's our other definition of delta G. Delta G is equal to negative RT natural log of equilibrium constant. So all three of these, delta G, equilibrium constant, self potential, are all tied together. They're all just different ways of saying the same thing. So if we have, so what we'll do, we'll take our break, we'll come back at 10 after, and we're going to calculate from the self potential, we're going to calculate delta G and K under standard conditions for this reaction. <laughs> 10 minutes. See you then. Okay. I was trying to explain that to Kyle in the library. We have a back question of the lab. It's like the polarity. Yeah. Like the polar one. Right. I got like, oh, yeah. So, you know, like, this, this, I got to like, hold a top of one. Well, <laughs> That's like a hugely constant. Sorry, right? Like a polarity one is pretty concentrated usually. Like the most thing, like like the more active, it's definitely concentrated. And the hydrochloric acid, like fucking H is zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what it does, as long as the reaction has the same number of base components, like top and bottom, then as long as they're equal, yeah, they can't slot. You still get a huge movement at zero. Yeah, yeah. So as long as so it could be point zero 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 one squared of point zero zero one exactly exactly right. and what will stop then is as soon as you get away from that one to one ratio as soon as it starts reacting you start making more products yeah yeah then it'll very quickly fall apart and your your voltage will start start dropping pretty dramatically but in you know in cases like this where as long as it's one to one. Then, then you can say the same thing for all of those, right? Because Q here is equal to concentration of zinc ions over concentration of copper ions. If one of these had to be squared, though, that doesn't work. And that's why having the balanced reaction makes a big difference for this. And why, if you look at all the reactions, all the half reactions in um, our they all have two electrons. Yeah. So they're all going to be thousands yeah. uh, already and allow us to do that. So the Q doesn't make that big of a difference. Yeah, I that's the one. Yeah, that's what it would be. It's like 94,000 something. I could look it up. I was just trying to save myself in key strokes. We don't have it on the end, but this was, I think, the last one. Yeah, I have different. I made different equation sheets with different different constants on them for all the classes. Yeah, um, which part of that is to save your sanity so that you don't have you know when you're in one hundred and one and you start seeing things like the base constant pop up, it just gets confusing. Yeah, bro. Hey, Sean, what's a chemical species? Uh, it just means a compound. Like any, like so, like any compound. Yeah, any CO. I so I, in this case, it, it, it isn't necessarily even just a compound. It can also just mean an ion. Like chloride is a chemical species. It's okay. it's an archaic way of saying it, but it just means something. So it basically, your system molecule. Yeah, or an ion or atom or just something. It's sort of the catch-all term. Yeah, it could be an atom as well. Yeah, if you had helium atoms that were uncharged floating around in a 
it's it can mean basically anything in solution or in your system that you're talking about. So like water is, is a species, is a chemical species, but so is chloride and so is CO2 if it's there. Anything you can have a concentration of, basically. Um, but it saves you from being technically wrong by saying compound like I just did. Because it's not even really just a compound, it's just anything. So it could be homogeneous or it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, if you have pure water with nothing else in it, then the only chemical species present is water. And then heterogeneous, it could be that as well. Yeah. Shit for like three months from many of the UCs. Now they just spam me all the time. <laughs> just keep waiting. Yeah. Well, now they know you're about to make them some money. So now they're, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm your friend. You and are also welcome to the pack. Say that. Way back. Welcome to the back. Actually, the wolf pack. The wolf like Yeah. It's like if you go if you go to if you go to UNR from uh Lake Todd Community College, it's like you're like becoming like a bigger, scarier dog. Really? <laughs> like you're like a Pokemon. I guess the uh you gotta go to the dire wolves. You gotta go to like Russia, some Russian university next. Um, you could, yeah. There's a few actually mascots in the U.S. that are that are collectively plural. Yeah. Um, Banana slugs. Uh, Elk Grove. Elk Grove High School at the Thundering Herd. Ooh. Um. Mine is the uh, the beach. 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 Yeah. Beach. Beaches. Yeah. Beach. Like that was, they went from the 49ers to just beach. Yeah. 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 Um, except that they what they interpreted that as a lion with kelp for a mane. Ooh, oh, which that's good. Cool. Bothered all the biology that's majors. Best. No, it's not. Yeah. Is it Christian? That was my main university. That's uh, Beach. Yeah. Sean, have you been to some of the sports games here? Yeah. Some of the sports okay. camps. Some of the sports yeah. games. Yeah. 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 I think that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They get a little piece of my house. They're going to get but then, like the chaos. Yeah, yeah. Like, 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 and then you can see, right? Well, I, mean, I, I, I don't go to enough of them, but it doesn't really have any like, sports teams. You know, they have like, some of these stuff. Yeah, no. We don't like the biggest to make it. You know, and they like they held. Boycotts like do not change the name, whatever yeah. you do. But what? From banana slugs. Oh, did they change the name? No, they are still banana slugs. I was just saying when my when my wife went there, they like were actively considering banana slugs. Yeah, they're like, 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 they're Mascot for this like top of community college. Oh, that exists here. Yeah, yeah this is the one. So, isn't native. Yeah, it's not native. So, yeah. It would be the cutthroat. So, yeah. The cutthroat is going to be a great term. Yeah, that would be even better. Paho cutthroats. I still think Trucky High School should be a campus. 
I got I got I got high school no, it's actually crazy. I learned about the Dominic Murray in like fourth grade or something, and it was like so fascinating, and I still have never been to the museum. I've been no. here like 10 years, and I like the museum's go. a little creepy. What's the museum? Like? What museum? I don't know. It's, it's like, like the Donner. Remember you went there? Oh, we have a third beat. You're part of the military museum. John, yeah. 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 the big statue? Yeah. Yeah. Big statue of what? Uh, I, feel like like the, I feel like living in Tahoe, like no one ever talks about the Dominic you know? But it's like... Yeah, you hear about Dominic. My son's into it right now. He's been to that museum. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, apparently the old school Oregon Trail, you can still get for free on, okay, on, yeah. on, on Chromebooks, and he has a Chromebook, and so his teacher shook in fourth grade, showed him for the old Oregon Trail, Heck yeah. and he's he's like, oh, I died again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, But he's really like, I understand the daughter party now. That's what happens with him all the time. It turns out. Yeah. Yeah, the museums like, like uh, I don't think they 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 barely ever bring up. Anything. What the yeah. party's oh, famous really? part. It's like not revisionist necessarily, but like, yeah. like, like you pretty much like want to walk in and like there's like an arm hanging up to the ceiling. Yeah. You know, that'd be sweet. Well, so it's more of like a nice spider. Yeah. Yeah. A few of the, of the cabins, and it was it was not like they killed people mm -hmm. to keep them. Yeah. 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 It, it, like that was like just a part of it. Like their whole like. They killed some people. Really? So that's definitely the museum. Yeah. From the same they only ate me out for all day. I guess horses and stuff. Yeah, they ate their own. 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 Also, fair warning, don't ever eat um, brain matter from anything relatively closely related to a mammal, because that's actually the biggest danger of cannibalization, is um, if you eat brain matter that's contaminated with prions, or prions, I've been told I was pronouncing it wrong before, prions, are basically misfolded proteins that cause the other proteins around them to misfold. What's that? Yeah, lapping death. They also call it very, very. Um, or some sometimes that gets a little hazy because sometimes very, very was just vitamin C deficiency. Um, but they produce similar effects. If anybody's ever watched the movie The Road, um, there was uh, the, the um, they met up. It's a post apocalyptic hellscape and people are eating other people all the time. Filmed, um, in, filmed in Pittsburgh, oddly enough. Um, one of the giveaways was that one of the people that they met had the shakes, um, because that's one of the symptoms of getting this this disease, getting this pr these prions inside of you, is it messes with your your ability to have fine motor control. It's also the same thing that that is uh, mad cow disease. Um, mad cow disease is the same thing. Mad cow disease happens not because the cows transmit it to each other, but because they're fed feed that contains trace matter of dead cows. Um, some of which include brain matter. And so they tried to stop that by having it go through, they would say feed the, the brain that was contaminated with, with cow brain, they would feed that to chickens, and then they would feed the, a brain contaminated with chicken matter to the cows, except that prions are really durable, and so it could go through like several generations um, and still be contagious to the cattle if it, they were exposed to it again. So, and it's not even a truly disease, it's not even a virus, really. It's just a misfolded protein that causes all the other proteins around it to become misfolded. And it specifically happens in, in mammal brains. Um, and so don't eat any mammal brains. 
a bad idea. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily a great idea, though. Indiana Jones was right. <laughs> we won't even get into Temple of Doom and all this vaguely racist undertones. Not even vaguely. <laughs> yeah. Just racist undertones. Um, all right. So here's the constant that we need to do yeah. this. Faraday's constant. It's on the equation sheet for this class. Um, I cannot, while I'm having other discussions, um, find that equation sheet, but it's on the uh, canvas shell. 96,485. So let me go back to the... So F equals 96485. That's Coulombs per mole. We're not going to do anything with Coulombs. We just need to know that that's the charge on a mole of electrons, the unit of charge. That is your so if we want to get from the cell potential to delta G, we're going to use moles of electrons, the voltage, and Faraday's constant. When you multiply all those units together, we're going to end up in units of kilojoules per mole. Or joules, I believe that's joules per mole. All right, so if we're trying, if we know E, what is E in this case? Which of these has to be flipped around? So all for one. All right, so E for the cell is going to be 0 0.43. Yes. Yeah. Then we know that and we know Faraday's constant. What is N going to be for this reaction? In order to get the, the electrons to cancel out, we have to times the bottom by four, right? Which means we'd have four electrons on the reactant side and four electrons on the product side once we flip the bottom one. So in that case, N for the balanced reaction is four. And you can think of the units on that is moles of electrons per mole of reaction. It is, but that's what's going to allow us to tie into the fact that delta H is dependent on how many moles of reaction we have, but cell potential isn't. This is what allows that to work, to allows us, what allows us to tie these together. So delta G in under constant, if we're under standard conditions, we're talking about delta G naught and E naught. Negative four times F time is equal to, or times E, 0.43. What do we get? We should get something in the ballpark of 1.6 times 96,000. So, something in the 100,000 range? The, the negative number, negative 165, and then 954. Negative, sorry, one, negative 165? 1,954. How many? That's on my phone, so. Okay, no, that's okay. That's enough. That's in joules per mole, which is why it's so big. That's how we know it's in one of the ways we know it's in joules, not in kilojoules. That, in fact, that all of our basic equations, very few of them have prefixes in the units that come out, right? Um, and really, that comes out of the, the charge on from the Coulomb's unit is how you get there. All right, so how many sig figs are we going to keep? Yeah. 
got four sig or five sig figs, or as many sig figs as we need on F, right? Two sig figs there. One. That's the counting number. There's no way we're off by an entire electron, right? It's not four plus or minus one electron. That's an exact number. So that's infinite sig figs. So two sig figs. So 1.6 times 10 to the five joules. Or sorry, 1.7. Thank you. And it's negative. And it's negative. <laughs> so in other words, what does that tell us about this reaction as written? This reaction is spontaneous, which kind of makes sense. Silver is known for being pretty, pretty resistant to oxidation, but it does oxidize, right? That's what silver tarnish is. Silver tarnish is not just dirt. It's actually silver oxide built up on the outside of, of uh, any silver. Can we talk about polishing silver in this class yet? Polishing silver is actually taking silver oxide. And turning it back, right? And turning it back. Whoa. Because you mix silver oxide plus zinc and you get zinc oxide, which is soluble, and silver metal. And this is usually, we write it solid, but it's really, that's what, it's like a paste. If you've ever polished silver, um, of course, silver polish is like this weird, gritty texture. That's because it basically ground up metal zinc, sometimes aluminum, but usually zinc. Um, because zinc oxide is soluble, and that's why it's a paste rather than just a powder, is because you want a little bit of moisture on it so that you'll allow that zinc oxide um, to, to come off the surface. Oh. So you're not just scrubbing the silver oxide off, you're actually physically turning it back. So you actually have the same silver atoms at the end that you started with. But they don't get deposited back in exactly the same spot, which is why over time, really old silver that has had like a you know a really fine filigree or something in it, a really a design, starts to get kind of polished off. All those atoms are still there, but they're not put back in the same spot. So if you polish it enough, you wind up losing the really, really fine details. But it still has just as much silver as it started with if you did it right. Anyway, so this is undoing the process we got from the other reaction. I'm going to clear this. Are we good with, with uh, this slide as it is? So we wound up with delta G equals, and this is technically delta G naught, um, is equal to negative 1.7 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole. So if we want to know what the equilibrium constant is for this, the Kc is for this. Now that we know delta G, now we can just solve for K. Remember the other form of this equation is just E to the minus delta G naught over RT. So as long as we know what T is, let's assume 298 Kelvin, we can plug everything in and get a value, which with this being so downhill in energy should be a pretty large equilibrium constant. Because for this to work, remember R is in units of joules per mole Kelvin, right? So we need to leave it as 10,000, or sorry, uh, 170,000 joules. You're going to divide by 298, divide by 8, but that's still going to be a pretty big number for delta G naught over RT. E to the 1.7, negative, negative. We'll do it like that. That's a negative, negative. All of that over 8.314 joules per mole and that joules per mole Kelvin and then 298 
So that's going to give us something like 32, e to the, e to the positive 32-ish. Pretty big K value. 170,000. This These two multiplied together are pretty dang close to, to 2,400, right? 300 times 8 is going to be really close to 2,400. Call that 160 instead of 170. 16 divided by 2.4. It's going to give you something in that 32 range ish. Thank you. That's so bad. That was pretty small. It's not so bad. Which really does illustrate just how strong of an oxidizer oxygen is. This isn't even that silver is pretty stable when you but when you put it with oxygen, K is six times ten to the twenty nine in favor of oxygen producing and oxidizing whatever whatever it's with. Um, gold and platinum are slightly higher than oxygen. In, on those on those cell potentials, which is why they don't oxidize much, really at all. There's some tiny amount, but equilibrium constants still mean you're going to get some tiny amount of product, but it's pretty tiny and really really slow. All right, so this is just basically taking our delta G equation that we had before. He said, well, if we know that delta G is equal to the negative NFE, we can just substitute that in both of these places. Negative NFE would equal to negative NFE naught plus RT ln of Q. Same <laughs> delta G reaction we looked at earlier. We're just going to solve for E. You solve for E by dividing both sides by negative n f we can wind up then we can separate those out right we get cell potential is equal to cell potential standard cell potential plus well, negative now, minus RT over NF ln of Q. It's a lot of variables in there, but now that we know what F is and how to count N, none of them are particularly tricky, right? R is still just R, so make sure you're in energy units. D is still just temperature in Kelvin. That's still our reaction quotient. So what this tells us is that our cell potential, just like our delta G was dependent on equal our reaction quotient, our cell potential is dependent on our reaction quotient too. If we have a whole lot more product than reactants, that's going to make this term non-zero, which means our measured cell potential is not our standard cell potential. As long as everything's a concentration of one, though, the same thing happens. If everything's a concentration of one, Q is one, log of Q is zero, in which case our cell potential is the standard cell potential. And in theory, it doesn't even matter what the temperature is. When we say standard conditions, as long as all of our Q's, if Q is one, it doesn't even matter what the temperature is. Cell potential is the same, no matter what. As soon as Q is not one, temperature plays a role as well.
So this version, this combined version, is called the Nernst equation. Maybe it's just a product of when I learned first learned this was coincided kind of closely when the original time the Skyrim came out, but I can't see that without seeing nerd root, which is a little rare root that you have to, a little plant that you have to go find in Skyrim sometimes. I spent too much time playing Skyrim. For whatever reason, they're conflated in my head. The nerd root equation is one that allows us to get our current self potential. It's really, really weird that my son's getting into the same, the same games haven't changed. My son's playing Skyrim for his first time. As a 10 year old, it's like, it's the exact same game. I still know where all the stuff is. Um, that's probably also why that's at the front of my mind right now, because he's asking me questions. What is this stuff? What does this mean? Anyway, um, sometimes you will see this in a non-natural log form. We put it log base 10, and it's still the same equation. You just have this 2.303 term multiplied in the front. I don't like that. It doesn't make any sense to me. Natural log is good enough for me. There's no need to do this. Um, be careful with Wolfram Alpha, though. Um, Wolfram Alpha is developed in, I want to say the UK, but in Europe somewhere. And in Europe, log means natural log. If you mean log base 10, you have to write log base 10, um, which also kind of makes sense. But, and so, but if you're typing things into Wolfram Alpha, you just literally, if you want to take log base 10 or something, you just type it like that, log 10 of something. If you just type log, it'll interpret as natural log. Natural log is it's pretty, it's pretty undeniable for those yeah. of us who work in the natural world. I think it's really just programmers that disagree with us. Uh, and then this is the version, again, still the same exact equation. But if you assume that you're at standard temperature, 298 Kelvin, this is the version that shows up in your lab write-up. In your lab write-up, it just gives you this. This is just combining F and R and T and the natural log term all into one variable, one constant. Again, I don't like that because I like to know where my constants come from. I don't want to memorize that if I already know what R and F are. I don't need to also memorize that. So I would rather have a more generic form, but I, unfortunately, I'm not the only one who writes chemistry curriculum. So. Maybe fortunately, I don't think I want that kind of responsibility. Um, you will see these versions of it as well. And as long as you know what the variables are, you know that N is your number of electrons. It's really, this does speed up the process, I suppose. Make that concession. So here's another example, same reaction we saw before. If we assume we're at 298 Kelvin, but now we have non-standard concentrations, what's our cell potential? What's our E naught? Does anybody remember what that number was? If we needed to flip the top reaction around so that we got negative 0.54, and so that it was 1.33 plus negative 0.54, I think it was 0.79. What's the six, six. six. And again, we're being really careful moles of electron per mole of reaction. Again, it looks weird, but just think of it as giving context to these units. It's not just a unitless number. That's what the six is. It's moles. Of Technically, it's unitless because it's moles of electrons per mole of reaction. Moles cancels moles, but if you keep it, it makes more sense if you think, of, at least to me, mm -hmm. put a unit to it so you know what that six represents. How come, how come like subscripts were never adopted in like situations like that? Um, they are, I use them sometimes, but typically we use subscripts on variables yeah. and we use, well, you know, we use adjectives or, or qualifiers on units. Um, so, 
we might say that temperature initial is 298, but we wouldn't Kelvin, but we wouldn't say 298 Kelvin initial yeah. as a subscript. Well, why would I, I just mean like like a N of electrons as opposed to oh, that would be totally valid, but that is just not the most common way of seeing it. I would prefer it that way, uh, frankly, but again, I don't always make the decisions just for this class. Yeah. All right, so what is the last thing we need to plug in here? We already did the work of having these. If we're out standard conditions, we can just use that version. So we don't need R, we don't need F, we don't need T. We just need Q. That's an error. If you were wondering. Products over reactants. Products over reactants, exactly. So, and again, anything solid or liquid doesn't show up. Just like before, our third rule of equilibrium. Ignore liquids and solids. So we're going to have concentration of chromium three plus squared over iodide to the sixth and H plus the 14th and dichromate to the one. Why did you put, oh, okay. As long as we're given all of those, we are, and conveniently, ones with the highest exponents are just one. It's almost like this isn't a real system and they just made up numbers. Almost. We're going to get dichromate squared. Dichromate is, or sorry, chromium 3 is 1 times 10 to the minus 5. We're going to square that, so we're going to get 1 times 10 to the minus 10 on top. These are just going to turn into 1, and we have 2 on the bottom. Right, so Q is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 10. I have to right there, but I just leave myself for And on the bottom, we get 2.0. We'll get five times 10 to the minus 11 per Q. Then we can just plug it in. Log of 5.0 times 10 to the minus 11 is going to be something between negative 11 and negative 10, negative 10 point something, right? If we're in base 10. We're good if I erase this. Can I have a zero point? For your final self potential. Uh, like this log is base 10. This is log base 10, yeah. So we actually can amp up the voltage, no pun intended. We can increase the voltage by playing around with Q. If we set it up so that we have way more reactant than product, just like Le Chatelier's principle, or just like equilibrium in general, we can force equilibrium more to the right by having extra reactant around. Um, and so all of this is stuff that factors into how do we design better batteries. You know, you can design a battery with just using any half reaction, just by varying the concentration, you can use the same half reaction in two different um, cells, just like we did in, we did that with the copper in lab, right? For part, was it two? 
where you had copper on the inside and copper at the outside with two different concentrations, you can still get a measurable voltage by doing that because of this equation. Because if Q is not one, we wind up with some small amount of voltage, even if E naught is zero. All right. Now we're going to talk about what happens, make it go backwards. Turns out when you apply the right amount of voltage, if you apply a voltage difference, we can actually get those energy levels to shift. We can actually force electrons to go uphill in energy, basically. If we hook this up to a power supply, such that we're forcing the electrons to go opposite their normal direction, we can undo these. Basically, by applying a voltage, we're actually changing the equilibrium, so we're not at equilibrium anymore. We're changing delta G by applying external energy. It's not a closed system now. And so we can wind up causing the reaction to go in the non-spontaneous direction. If you've ever wondered how we're able to make these really super unstable compounds like, like solid sodium metal or potassium metal, those don't occur in nature. They have such strong reduction potentials that you can't basically can't take anything in nature and make sodium ions into sodium metal. Unless we change those energy levels by applying a voltage to it. And that process is called electrolysis. Um, it's called electrolysis because the original lys uh, lysis means splitting in Greek. So applying an electric voltage to cause things to split, this was originally discovered talking about water. You could take water and apply a voltage and turn it into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And then if you remove the voltage source and added a spark, it went back to the other way it was. But we can basically separate those electrons, push them opposite the way they normally go, according to delta G, by using voltages. Um, and here's another example. In theory, you could take salt water and apply a voltage to it, and you would make chlorine gas on one electrode and sodium metal on the other electrode. Um, it wouldn't be a very stable situation because chlorine gas is really reactive, and so is sodium metal. If we're doing this in water, that's really, really unstable, right? Um, because what does sodium metal do when it reacts with water? It explodes, catches fire, breaks beakers, um, all of those fun things. Yes. When uh, I had a similar project to your research project in my AP chemistry class, after we took the AP test, we still had a month of class left, and the, the uh, teacher's like, well, here's the stock room, here's a list of cool stuff you could do, we'll pick a project and do it. Um, and our final pre presentation was basically they brought the middle school over to the high school and we got to blow stuff up for them. It was super fun. Probably half the reason that I became a chemistry major because I had so much fun just screwing around in the chemistry lab. Um, but we, me and my friends actually talked about if we could do this, could we apply a voltage source and actually create sodium metal and chlorine gas from sodium chloride? Um, the problem is you either have to do it in water, in which case nothing lasts, or you have to do it in molten NaCl. If you do this with NaCl as a liquid, um, then you can get this to happen. The problem is you also have to do it in an anoxic environment, so no oxygen present, um, and sodium chloride melts at like 4,000 Fahrenheit. It's really high melting point. Um, so we kind of had to shelve that idea. It is doable, though in theory. Um, and, but here's the lab that we're going to be doing next week. The electrolysis lab is basically we have a bunch of these DC power supplies. If we hook them up and we set one of our one of those cables to um, uh, in one container and another the other cathode, the other anode, sorry, the other electrode, that's the term I'm looking for. Um, on, physically separated from it at one end that the anode where it's positively charged where with, this is where the reduction or where the oxidation happens. No, what I said it right the first time. That is confusing. The 
anode is negatively charged. That's what I mean about get consistent with your science, people. Um, the anode is negatively charged. So that's going to be where the oxidation happens. So you can actually take water and oxidize the oxygen in it to make oxygen gas. And on the other end, you'll wind up reducing the hydrogen in water to make hydrogen gas. Um, and if you physically separate them and use gas laws, you can actually work out how many, how many molecules of hydrogen gas did you produce and how many molecules of oxygen gas did you produce. This is one of the ways that you can measure Avogadro's number is because you can actually use the Coulombs, the charge of the electrons is, was measured. And then you can use that to figure out and then use the ideal gas constant uh, ideal gas law to figure out how many molecules of each of these did you get. And you do, in fact, see it's a two to one ratio in terms of the amount of, of uh, volume of gas that you produce, which is kind of fun. And the best thing about this lab is if you generate a whole bunch of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, the most responsible way to dispose of it is to light it on fire and watch it explode. So we'll probably do that next week as well. Um, Be responsible. Be responsible. That's exactly what we're going to do next week. Um, and in the meantime, so going back to just because we only have a few minutes left, that molten NaCl, one of the coolest things about it is it's not colorless. It's actually like a really deep, opaque purple. Um, because by separating these out and changing the intermolecular forces by turning into a liquid, you change what wavelengths of light it can absorb. And it turns out it's actually even way more explosive than sodium metal is. If you take melted NaCl, you dump it in water, it crystallizes, it solidifies all at once. And all of that phase change energy that you had to dump into it, getting it up to 4,000 Fahrenheit, is released all at once. Um, and I have a really cool video. Let's go. <laughs> Um, turn on the iMac. <laughs> molten, molten, pouring molten salt into water. Explosion. He's in Florida. That's Florida. Oh! My God. <laughs> Which 
That's how solidification of salt is. That's not making sodium at all or chlorine or anything like that. That's just a phase change. A really, really fast, really exothermic phase change. All right. Have a good day, everybody. I'll see you on Wednesday or Thursday. Thank you.